Today on Exploring Scotland's History, we're in the shadow of Ben Cruachan and we're going to travel along Glen Lonan, which is also known as the Road of the Kings. Tradition says that this road would have been taken by the funerary processions of those kings on their way to Iona. The little glen is peppered with cairns, duns, kists, standing stones. It would be a fair indication that many years ago this place was a whole lot busier than it is today. And as we meander down the glen, perhaps we'll get a feeling for how busy and well populated this glen was in past times. Our first stop is just at the start of the glen, just outside Tenault, and this is it. This is a Royal Observer Corps underground monitoring post. It was built in 1940 and was only decommissioned in 1991. It's listed on the map as a covered water outlet. Clearly it's not. It hides something much more interesting. Just in front of us there is one of the old charcoal burning platforms. Uh, we discussed them in Glen Nant, which is actually just the next Glen along. It's basically over there. Uh, when we were discussing the Napoleonic ties to the area. I'll stick a wee link up to a video. Parts of this area, as you can see, have quite modern housing on them. In the day, there would have been mills and burning platforms, people preparing charcoal, a whole lot different. We're now in the area of Ardenny and it was thought to be a religious site in the 9th century and abandoned in the 10th. And then obviously the buildings were utilised as dwellings. There was up to 10 dwellings in this area. Again, a modern campsite, um, chalets have taken over its place. The bird song is something to behold. There are three marked out routes around the garden, ranging from 30 minutes to an hour. They do have the disclaimer that some of the paths might be a wee bit muddy, but it's been dry for days, so I think we'll be okay today. Don't know what he's getting dirty looks about. So this is Angus's garden. Behind us is Angus's lock, which was actually named Angus's lock before Betty MacDonald actually owned the property. But she started the garden up as a memorial for her son, who had died in Cyprus. Her son Angus had been shot dead by the EKOA which were a group of freedom fighters that were really attempting to push independence in Cyprus with any manner of means. Angus at that time was working as a reporter for the British government and when he did die, he was buried in Cyprus with full military honours. Angus passed at the young age of 28 and Betty built this garden up really as a place for peace, forgiveness and reflection. On a day like today, it is really quite a beautiful and peaceful place to be, apart from me banging on. 
to go back looking at nice flowers. This is Deirdre's Bell. It was created for Betty MacDonald who made Angus's garden in 1956 and it really does have quite spectacular views over the Kruachan range. Some of the paths about here are quite steep but it is definitely worth it. There's some natural steps made out of bits of tree that can be probably touch and go if they were wet but it's really really worth it for the views in this little place. To sit here in the glorious sunshine this is really a perfect example of the things that this little glen has to offer we're sitting in angus's garden over there is bargullion farm it's an 18th century farm in front of it we presume is a building that used to have a crock roof beyond the farm are cairns that were as large as five by four metres with false portals and protruding stones. Up behind the farmhouse there are the remains of a fort. It was an oval fort and was 13 by 10 metres. Also around this area there is a lot of indications of old furrows and lazy beds and the old style of farming. These are really what's left of Duntanakin, an old settlement of eight buildings in the shadow of Kruachan again. There must have been a decent number of people and in industry out here in the 17th 18th century as there are three of the buildings are registered as being over 20 meters long unfortunately rubble is all that remains there are some old stone walls that would indicate that there had been some arable farming happening or division of land at least but in 1874 it is registered as completely cleared of people Behind me where there is that deforestation, there is an ancient settlement called Barglass. I'll put some footage up now because we have visited there in the winter. It's not registered where the actual clearances per se are concerned, but it is an abandoned settlement in the middle of the forestry and there are old millstones and stuff up there that can be observed as well. Just there, in the garden of that house, is a burial cairn. Jam on Glen Lunan. Are you? Yeah, we're gonna just ignore you in general, Martin. Hello, son. Hello. Hello. This is one of the many clearance cairns that litter the glen as well. As you can see, a clearance cairn is filled with stones, 
but don't confuse it with a burial cairn. A clearance cairn is basically where the farmers and those that were working the land carried all the stones and all the rubble so that their fields would be more easily planted and would be easier for arable land. So that's a clearance cairn. I'm currently standing on top of a burial cairn. It was excavated in 1870 and there was a capstone nearly a metre square found on it. The interesting thing about this particular burial cairn is even though there were no grave goods found, there were human bones. The forest in this part of the glen is interesting in itself and again holds clues to how vibrant a population was working and living in the glen. There have been remains of an oval dun found up in the woods and also round hut circles. Oh dear, look what I find. It looks like our Duncan from the previous video has a flatmate. Just here is a grassy knoll with a lovely tree on it. In 1969, Lorne Archaeological Society excavated this, presumed to be a dun. They found two fragments of rotary cairn stone. So it was obviously lived in, like everywhere else in the glen, at some stage. And as you're heading down the glen, just at the side of the road, some standing stones. Not much information on these ones. <laughs> As we listen to the cacophony of lambs in the background, it's that time of the year. This part of the glen is called Tom Croy. And I'll tell you why. Some time ago, there was a very interesting slab found in the glen. Tom Croy. It had a Latin sunken cross uh, cut into it and you could see various weave work. There's a picture of it up there if you want to have a wee look. Again, like so many things when we go to have a look at them, they've already got to the Museum of Scotland, but it will preserve them, that's fine. I'm going to have a wee walk now down to Dermot's Pillar and tell you the story of him. With its stone circle beside it, it is said to be the burial place of Dermot, the giant famous in the stories of Finn McCool and the hero of Irish legend. Gronya, who had been promised to the Finn McCool, fell in love with Dermot and when he said, no, nope, I'm not going against the boss, she basically put him under a druidic spell, which involved bonds that he would basically agree to everything that she suggested that he do. So they ran away together. The traditional story goes that her family did look for them in the woods around this area, but Finn McCool's own dog, Bran warned them off and they managed to escape to freedom. Grania and Dermot would eventually see themselves as a couple. They moved back to Tara in Ireland and she bore him four sons. But Finn was obviously a bit of a boy that held a grudge. We do know about all his other stories of course. Unbeknownst to Dermot, Gronya's father had put a druidic spell on him as well, which meant that he would be doomed if he entered into a boar fight. He didn't know that, but Finn McCool did, and McCool eventually caught up with him. He challenged Dermot to catch a boar. Dermot didn't know the full story, 
So Dermot fully agreed to do it. In the catching of this boar, Dermot was fatally wounded, but he beseeched the better personality of Finn McCool as he knew he had magical powers and that if Finn McCool had put his hands in water and put the water on a person that they could instantly heal them. McCool wasn't playing the game. He went to the stream three times and on the return journey let the water run through his hands and Dermot perished. Like all Celtic stories there is a lot more complexity to it and I would maybe recommend the book Legends of the Celts by Frank Delaney for those who want to read a wee bit more. We're just at the middle of the glen really and that is Dun Neil. Uh, it had been pretty much mangled with mining works but they did find bits and pieces that would suggest that it had been used as a dump. We're just at the Y junction part way up the glen. Um, we have alternatives of Tynault, Connell or Kilmore. But there was a very interesting archaeological find here. On this site archaeology found a copper alloy medieval sword pummel and it had heraldic decoration on it. It's very clear, as we've headed down Glen Lonan, how much activity there once was in this wee glen. And just behind us, again, we will find burial kists, cairns, duns, forts, absolutely peppered with them. You can't attack people, it's not nice. It's not nice. We have a bit of an aggressive sheep issue here. He's quite determined to take me on. That is Barnacari Cranach. He's a cheeky. Oh, look at this one. Hello. Hello. On the Cranach has been found peat ash, bones, nuts and charcoal. There is another Cranach here, but it's clearly underwater currently. The Serpent Mound used to be known as the Tomb of the Giants and of the Finn. Legend says that Finn McCool isn't dead, he's merely sleeping with his warriors in the cave and when his hunting horn is sounded thrice, he shall return. The cairn was excavated in 1972 to reveal a massive triangular shaped kist containing a cremation deposit and a flint knife. There are two cairns and a chambered cairn that sit behind it as well. It's worth pointing out that the serpent mound does align with one of the Cranachs on summer solstice. So this is where our story ends. We're back down on Loch Fechan at Carignan Marv, the Rock of the Dead. This is a natural jetty down here. I will put a link to a video. We actually canoed down the loch um, and looked at various other bits and pieces of historical interest. But this is where the kings would have rested and waited until their final journey to Iona. I expect waiting for a fair wind. We have saw a lot of kists and burial cairns as we have wended our way down Glen Lonan. 
the road of the kings. You can't help wondering, is there the possibility that not all those kings did make it to St Oran's burial ground on Iona? There's an awful lot of kists on that king's road. If you enjoyed the video, please like and leave me a comment. It really does help the channel. If you would like to subscribe, you'll catch me on the next adventure. And feel free to join me on Facebook and Instagram of the same name, Exploring Scotland's History. I will put links below. Thank you so much for watching. Can I take this opportunity to thank the viewers who have bought me a coffee? I am grateful and humbled in equal amount. Your generosity will help fuel both myself and my vehicle to go that wee bit further to find the historical gems. Thank you so much.